All right, uh, welcome everybody. This afternoon it's about DSLs in the cloud. DSL stands for Domain Specific Languages. And, um, we're from Typefox. This is my colleague Miro. I'm Jan Köhnlein. And we've been building these DSLs on the Eclipse basis for years now because we're strongly affiliated with the XTEX project, you may know. And uh, now that everything is moving into the cloud, the big question is, can the same be done with a new tool set? And in the next half an hour, we're going to show you how we currently approach that topic. So this is the aim. A domain-specific language tool that runs in an IDE in the browser. That means something that can be hosted in the cloud, easily accessed using the browser by people from wherever they are. And it should have really the full functionality of an IDE. And I'll show you this in a demo. That's the wrong demo. This is the right demo. OK, for the sake of this, this is a bit small. I make it bigger. Oh, that's right. For the sake of this tutorial, I guess I, I created my, it must be my 20th state machine language in my life. All state machines are different. It's really always worthwhile creating new language for state machines. So bear with me, here's another one. It's a very simple language. It allows me to define a state machine, which consists, consists of states um, that are connected by transitions. And these transitions are fired by events. So when the state machine receives a certain event, it may transit to a new state. Pretty simple. If you know Xtext, who knows Xtext? Quite a few people. Uh, you know that you can create these kinds of languages pretty easily. And the same now holds also for the cloud. And I'll show you what kind of tooling you have to expect. So first of all, the tool helps me to uh, create, for example, a new state. And you see, oh, a new state is added. And I can, of course, also create a new event down here. This is cool. And um, uh, we have this content assist feature from other IDs as well here in this browser ID. So I hit control space and I get proposals for everything that's valid in this context. And this is specifically in this case because here is where the events are specified, all events in the model. So I choose one of these. I hit control space another time. Okay, there has to be this arrow thingy and then uh, a cross-reference to a new state, for example, idle. Okay, so this is pretty much standard tooling, what you would expect. You see a bit of syntax highlighting in here. We have um, uh, the uh, detection of um, syntax errors, as well as um, linking errors. So there is no state called idle underscore zero. So this is why you get these squiggles around. And it's an IDE, so you have a browser and um, can navigate through various files. Um, I even implemented a, a very small code generator because, I mean, DSLs are nice, uh, but they should not only be there to specify that the target is usually to make them executable in a way. So here's a small code generator that generates a Java class for us. And I could even, in this IDE, run this code generator in a terminal. So let's hope I get the syntax right. Java class path uh, WST bin, and then the name of the class, which is this one. It's a very simple one, so it's more like uh, an example thing. And you see we are starting in the active state, and this is a possible events that I allowed in my example here. So being active, I can fire these two events. Let's take draw opened. Oops, not here, but here. OK, so it takes me to the next state. All right, a working Java code generator. This is uh, all nice, but when you look at state machines, they have a pretty focus on these transition uh, things. So the connection between the states, they are pretty important in state machines. And this is something where graphics can really shine when it's about connections between elements. This is why we added graphics. So here is a, I close this terminal, you don't need it. Here is a, uh, a graphical representation of, you see, of what you see in the editor and it's fully synced. 
So we have these kind of what we call traces. When I select something here, uh, the diagram scrolls to, well, centers the element uh, that is uh, selected, and it works the other way around as well. So selection changes. And it's fully synchronized, so when I add a state here, it's being added to the diagram somewhere here. Okay, things can only be a bit improved, that's clear. Now here's my new state, and it, that also holds for connections. So we have a fully synchronized um, representation, text, and graphics. Good, so far for the initial demo. Let's go back to the slides. So our target, ADSL, Workbench, if you want so, in the browser, which has an intelligent DSL editor with code assist, syntax highlighting and the like, supporting users and creating correct models. And it has whoop, a code generator, it has uh, validation, it has content assist, um, integration with other tools, terminal, um, Git, whatever you want, and a graphical representation of the diagram as, uh, of the models and, as well. How do you realize such a thing in the web? Well, it makes sense to split the thing up into a client and a server part, because usually in a browser you don't deal with the local file system, you deal with something that is hosted in the cloud. So we have a server component serving this tool for you, and a browser component, uh, the browser that uh, runs the actual IDE application front end for you, and in between there is some communication over the network going on. And that separation is pretty popular because you can lose, use the language server protocol and then you, for your specific DSL, you just implement a language server and can use whatever front end uh, you like that supports the language server protocol, which is pretty cool because uh, that means you do the work only once. Um, then you have to code editors, the graphical views on the client side and on the server side you have the uh, editor services so, in fact, in the language server protocol, the entire smartness about the language is encapsulated in the server. So, when you want to have a code completion, a content assist at a certain piece, for example, that's a request that's processed at the server, and the proposals are then sent back to the client in order to be rendered. And, of course, the workspace resides on the server, and the graphics extensions have to have some kind of backend as well. That's the architecture of the entire thing. So uh, how would you implement that? And the technologies that we are going to use is uh, Thea, the new star on the browser <laughs> IDE uh, heaven. Um, that Thea allows us to have exactly that separation of a client and server. It works well with the language server protocol. So uh, it seems to be a good fit for our purpose. And it provides us with a text editor that can be uh, fed by language services. And um, on the server side, we're going to implement the language with Xtext, create a language server from that, extend it with graphics by means of the Sproddy framework, maybe lay out that entire thing with the Eclipse layout kernel, and then on the client, receive all the graphics that's processed here and render it with Sproddy as well. So this is pretty cool because all of that is Eclipse technology. Thea is Eclipse, LSP4J is Eclipse, XX is Eclipse, Sproddy is going to Eclipse now, ELK is Eclipse. So it's all open source, all free, all Eclipse. So you see, it's maybe a bit of a uh, complex tool stack so I won't go into details of implementing every single aspect of that, but I will roughly go through the steps, through the steps that lead to a working application in that scenario. And the first step is we highlight what you do with Xtext. So a lot of you know Xtext. In most of you, I guess, know Xtext because they have used it in order to generate a, an Eclipse plugin for it. But what is available for some time now is when you create an XX project, there's this language server setting it down here. So you can create a, instead of creating an Eclipse plugin, you can generate 
a language server for, for the language you specified with Xtext. And that's pretty cool. You don't need all the rest because we are now only doing web. Uh, so you can go for a full, mm, let's say, normal Java uh, setup, like the layout for a Gradle or a Gradle build. And um, that's basically the most important thing you have to do in order to get a language server from your Xtext grammar. Then you write an Xtext grammar, specify your language, then you write a code generator, make it executable, and then you hit the generate button and you get a language server. If you have never seen Xtext, this is exactly the, the entire grammar you need for that simple example. I admit it's a simple language, but that grammar is very simple when it comes to describing something that is actually executable. And this is the Xtext grammar language, so that's how it looks like, and this allows you to describe your models in that syntax here with the keywords, with the nesting of elements, and also with the cross-references, which is a bit specific in Xtext, but very, very handy when it comes to generating the tooling. Okay. In this talk, we are going to through the steps, the basic steps in a very uh, superficial way. You can always make it nicer and add some bells and whistles. So especially with Xtext, in this case, uh, everything's wired up with dependency injection and you can really uh, exchange every single aspect of the language, every component that somehow, every service that is uh, part of the runtime structure for it. You can change the way linking works, you can add more constraint validation, add a formatter, fine tune what content is this is like, and the like. So there's a lot of things you can do to make that really a great tool and a great language. Okay, this is cool, now we have a language server for the DSL we wanted to specify. How do we get that into the tool? Yeah, and into what tool? We want to build a TIA application, so how do we start with that? Or better, what is TIA? Have you heard about TIA? Who well, hasn't heard about TIA yet? <laughs> it's actually pretty much noise on TIA at this conference. We're happy about that. Um, TIA is this cloud IDE framework that allows you to uh, write, run the same IDE in the browser as as rich client locally, and it's written in TypeScript, so we are really coming now from the web native edge, so not implemented in Java or anything, it's really running in your browser natively, and also the backend is written in TypeScript. It has that front end back end uh, separation, and it supports the language server protocol by default out of the box. This makes it pretty a pretty good choice for the thing we want to build, because we already have the language server. In TIA, a TIA application is composed of extensions. Uh, in fact, everything in TIA is an extension, even the core of TIA itself is an extension. You can think of it as a plugin system. And um, these extensions usually have contributions to both sides of the world, as well in the IDE, in the client, as in to the backend. So they are kind of, you know, covering both. And they contribute by adding services to the DI, uh, dependency injection configuration of either the front end or the back end. Uh, so what do we have to do? We have to create a DSL extension, the extension for our DSL. That's what we have to do in order to get our language server in there. Okay, how do we do this? Uh, you don't have to read what's going on here, but the, the key point is we created a Yeoman. You know Yeoman? Yeoman. A Yeoman uh, generator uh, that scaffolds a Thea application and an extension for you. So it creates basically two uh, NPM packages, node packages, no, three. One is for your extension where your domain specific code goes in. One is defining the entire application. So you could say what other extensions should be part of this application, like if you want to have Git support and so on. And the last one is uh, for the browser, and the last one is the same for the rich client app that runs with Electron. We are only caring about the browser here, so, um, but it's maybe 
interesting to know that getting the rich client is almost as easy as what I'm showing here. Okay, so we have now a CI application and a CI extension, but that CI extension, of course, has no content yet, no proper content, because we haven't told it, use our language server, provide the language smartness. And this is the next step. So the next step will be to have, we have the language server, how do we make it, how do we embed it into the uh, CI extension that we just created. And this is basically three steps. From the extension point of view and from uh, Thea point of view, your language server is just an executable with a standard in and a standard out. And when you want to send a message to the language server, you just push something to standard in. And when you read something from it, you read from standard out. So it doesn't really matter in which language this language server is actually implemented. So we copy it like a binary into this extension and we create a launcher script saying, okay, please uh, run this whenever the user opens a DSL uh, file with a specific extension for our DSL. And then we have to register our language as well to the front end module as to the back end module, and that's it. Okay, so this is a little bit of code. Could be that in the future we kind of add that to the Yeoman generator, point it to the, uh, to the language server, make it even easier. But once you did that, you have a domain-specific tool already that supports your syntax and the text in the textual way. That's all you have to do. And you can make it nicer, of course. Adding syntax highlighting, that's not part of the LSP specification. So this is usually in, L in the language server protocol, this is part of completely client side. Uh, Thea allows you to register text made grammar for your language, which is pretty easy to write. And you can also configure bracket matching and folding some editor services that are not covered by the language server protocol. Okay, and then you have really have a nice textual tool already, but we promised you a bit more. We wanted to have these graphical views in, on top. And this is what Miro, who has been waiting for so long now, is going to show you in the next. Yeah, thanks, Jan. So, uh, for the graphical part, we're also going to use an Eclipse project, and it's Sprotty. It's a web-based diagramming framework. So the, the whole front-end part that does the actual visualization is implemented with native technologies for the web, like TypeScript, SVG, CSS. It's meant to support client-server scenarios like, uh, like we have it uh, with the language server protocol from the beginning. So, uh, so, so the separation of where do I get my model from and where do I visualize it is built into the framework. And it's currently moving to the Eclipse Foundation, so it will be available uh, on, on that basis. And, uh, and so we have also a good basis for collaboration between uh, d different parties on that. Um, not really long range here. Okay, uh, let's have a quick look at the client architecture. Uh, the Sprotty client visualizer has a um, uh, is separated into three main components that are that define the main control flow cycle. Uh, the one is the action dispatcher, which uh, gets events. We call them actions. For example, from the user interface or from the server that uh, that initiates uh, some event and sends it uh, to, to the client and decides what to do with the, with these event actions. And then, for some of them, it may transform that to executable commands. That are uh, that do, do something with our internal model, the Sprotty model S model. They execute it on the command stack, which makes them undoable and redoable. Also, all of these change the model in some way, and the viewer takes the modified model after every step and renders that so it's being visible to the user by generating some SVG in a uh, uh, yeah high performance. Uh, ways so that it's really smooth and nice. So the interesting part for this talk is how is the connection to the server. And yeah, we promised that Sprotty uh, um, supports this case and we do it uh, through a, so what we call a diagram server. 
which is a comp one component of this product that can be put in any kind of backend. We already provide a Java implementation or a Java API for that, but it could, in theory, be replaced by other languages because what is in between is just JSON data. And uh, <laughs> right. yeah, and uh, so in our scenario here, the diagram server uh, needs to be inside the Xtext language server because our data source is the DSL, and Xtext is the component that knows about how to parse uh, the uh, text content into an abstract syntax tree. So the the actual model that we can work with, and uh, so. The main component here is the diagram generator, which uh, outputs a Sprotty model out of any data source you want. In our case, an abstract syntax tree that is parsed by Xtext. And it's co in our case, it's communicated via the LSP channel that we already have. I just, yeah, just tell you. Click me. <laughs> yeah. So then we want to embed this into Thea. For the front end part, we want to put the, um, the Sprotty uh, visual, uh, front end visualization uh, part into a Thea widget so that it it's, will be available as a view and you can use it as any other Thea widget in the IDE, uh, drag it around as you're known from, uh, from IDE so, you can, so it has all the properties that a normal IDE widget should have. And yeah, in Eclipse it's called a view part or, or editor part. And for the backend part, um, so Thea has a backend that connects to the language servers. So th then in that context, it's already clear where to put the, uh, this diagram server and diagram generator. So Xtext offers an API to, to connect to that. So, so we re just reuse that API that is already present. Here's a, um, an example of uh, how this diagram generator could look like. This is ac actually a little bit trimmed down version of the generator used for the example that we have shown. Uh, it, the entry point is the generate method. It goes over the contents of the uh, Xtext resource, tr uh, transforms that to a, a Sprotty graph. Inside that, for every state, we generate a node. For every transition, we generate an edge. And here is the node creation method and here's the edge creation method. Uh, this language, if you don't uh, re recognize it, is extend, which is a, a Java dialect, um, so it's compiled to Java. And uh, we like to use that a lot in the content, uh, context of Xtext because uh, especially for model transformation cases like this and also code generation, it's really uh, useful. It has ne very nice features for that. Um, so here again, let's make it nice. What do we have to do th there? We could add custom figures. If uh, just simple circles or rectangles aren't, aren't enough, you can uh, define your own SVG-based figures by composing uh, SVG in any way you like. So that uh, gives you all the power you need. You can have sh any kind of shapes, style them with CSS, so sh uh, select c colors and uh, line styles. Then we also want automatic layout. Macro layout means layout of the whole um, of the whole graph uh, network with nodes and edges. For that, we use the Eclipse layout kernel, another Eclipse component that has very nice layout algorithms. And finally, tracing. A tracing means how to trace our uh, source model, which is the DSL uh, text, into uh, to the generated target, which is the the graphics, and we uh, need. Uh, this tracing, for example, to implement the selection tracking that uh, Jan has showed in, in the beginning. So when you click somewhere in the text, the corresponding node is, uh, is also selected in the graphics and the other way around. So and that is possible um, but using tracing information that is um, also stored in, in, the, in the server state so that, um, and you can use that tracing information for selection or other, other use cases too. Good, that was one uh, cut through this kind of architecture so far. Um, any questions to that? Yeah. I have one. What about editing, graphical editing? Okay, that's a good one. I hope you have a good answer to that. Yeah, okay, yeah. so <laughs> if, if you know me a bit, I always have, I have these talks on graphical views for years now, and um, I always say, 
please don't try to edit text and graphics in parallel. You run into problems. There is, is something, there are always issues that you're not gonna, going to resolve. So this is a picture from me, I guess, 10 years ago <laughs> when I started uh, talking at EclipseCon about these topics. Now I've grown a bit older. And um, yes, I see, I, I hear your, your, your questions and I see that this is a requirement to, you want to edit graphically. Um, but still, it's really tricky, the textual and graphical synchronization to make that right. So my opinion is, if you want to read, make it really correct and in the safest way, it must be text first. And what does that mean? That means that every action you do in the diagram, you actually map to an uh, operation on the textual model, so into a text edit, and then that is applied, and when the text model changes, the diagram is ch changed according to the text change, such that the flow of information is always the same direction, because that to and fro, so it's very difficult to do, maybe because X text has a two-week coupling of its semantic model with the text. So what we actually do is, we map everything you can do in the diagram currently, or a few of these operations, to text operations, like, um, and these text operations, they come from the language server. So this is pretty beta stuff. Um, bear with me if the, uh, things are not all working as they should, but um, I will give you a short demo on that as the last part of the presentation. So here we go. Uh, it looks... Uh, almost the same as uh, the one we had before. Oh, it's, there's a state, has to be, okay. Um, what you can do now here is we have a uh, admittedly bit ugly palette that allows me to add a new state in the diagram. And when I click it, what is actually done is, you see in this, uh, this bulb here, this is for code actions, something that the language server provides. So what actually happens is these, um, when the palette pops up, language server is contacted and asked, do you have any code actions for the thing that I'm currently in? And it returns the code actions. And when I use it, it applies the code actions to the text, and then the diagram is updated. So this is how state one came in. I can connect this state to another state. Oops, uh, it's a bit small, that button. Like this. And then once again, first, I calculate a text change to the text model that always leads, you know, it's always the one that has the uh, information, and apply that down here by adding a new transition. Yeah, what happens if I, I should have reset that model, okay. Um, this is a name waiting for draw new, so new is apparently something because I already tried it out. Uh, when I change that name, I have to change it all over the document, and that's exactly what a rename operation is. So, rename refactoring. So, I go the other way around and remove the new. <laughs> and you see that it has been replaced in the entire diagram, and then the diagram is updated and everything is as it should be. Uh, the last thing, which I think is pretty cool, is these labels here on the transitions, these are actually cross-references to events. So this is not where the event def is defined, like up here. It's just a cross-reference to that event. So when I want to say, oh no, please do that on a different event, I use the language server's content assist that I configured with Xtext to say, okay, at this place, what could be there? And I choose light on, a new event, and it gets replaced in the text, and then the, doc uh, the diagram gets updated. The good thing is, text is always leading, text can be versioned with Git and so on. And um, when you have a syntax error, it's easy to fix. Of course, there are also good ways to do the other way, just staying in the diagram world. The synchronization is always tricky. So from my point of view, that's the most stable thing you can do in this parallel editing in textual and graphical scenario. All right, so that's all. Um, so now it's time for some real question, I guess. Um, do we have any? No? Really? Okay. It's already pretty late. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to give this presentation. I hope you have a nice rest of the conference. And if you, have, if you, if you, if you remember any of the questions that you don't remember right now, you can meet us at the booth. Okay, thank you. <laughs>